Well, I just want to welcome everybody to our January 2023 uh, SHRS Innovation Institute uh, Innovation Seminar. Um, this month, we're really fortunate to have Garrett Grindle with us to present on his experience with industry-sponsored product development and evaluation. Uh, Garrett is the Associate Director for Engineering in the Human Engineering Research Lab here at Pitt. And he is um, in that role, he oversees design, development, and prototyping of many of the internal projects um, that are generated in the laboratory, but also is the conduit for a lot of the uh, interaction with industry who come to Hurl with help um, developing and evaluating their products. So I think it, we're really fortunate to have Garrett um, you know, talk about his experience working with industry and you know what's all involved with that because it's it's clearly different than uh, federally sponsored research and development, and there's there's some unique uh, circumstances that you need to take into consideration when when working with industry. And uh, Garrett has uh, experience with this, so Garrett, we're really uh, interested to see what you have to say about this. Thanks. Well, thanks for for the introduction, the generous introduction there, Dave, and thanks for uh, inviting me to speak here. Um, I, I, I kind, of, kind of lead off by saying, um, you know, I do miss our in-person lectures. So if anybody, I know, I'm sure people are sneaking this in, in between other things, but if you can be on camera, that's great. I love, love the feedback and, and uh, we always love interaction. And just because we're remote doesn't mean we have to have to sort of lose those um, sorts of things here. Hopefully you don't lose too many of my hand motions off screen. I also sort of miss those. Uh, in person here. So um, appreciate you all being here. And the other thing I'll preface things with this is uh, if you've done one industry sponsored project, you've done one industry sponsored project. Um, a lot of things uh, I'll be kind of putting out here are uh, maybe things we learned the hard way. <laughs> um, so I'm not professing to be the expert, uh, really just sort of telling a little bit about our experience and maybe things uh you know, we've learned along the way that that may be of value to you, uh, yeah, as you do your work here. So just keep that that in mind as we're going through things. Um, so quick introduction to like industry sponsored work. Um, you know, what what are what is industry sponsored work, um, or what are industry sponsored projects? And these are really um, individual projects that a external entity, usually a company, but the, um, We'll talk about some of our examples. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a for-profit um, company, but they're a non-government agency, and they're not really a non-profit that exists to hand out, out grants like uh, you know some of the non-profits uh, that, that we might be familiar with, like Nielsen Foundation here here in the in, in the rehab space, um, many others that really do exist to hand out grants. Um, these things are, are very much ad hoc. Um, most of these aren't a regular program uh, by a company, although some companies do have sort of regular programs for this. Um, but they're really uh, more informal projects in the sense of they start informal, but as you'll see maybe through here, um, you know, they need to be actually pretty formal. And a lot of that's on you to sort of make that happen and add some of that, that um, formality. Um, they're different from government grants. Um, while Pitt has their accounting, their sort of legal aspects that in a lot of ways make them behave a lot like uh, our government grants, from the company's point of view, they don't really care about our, our internal um, accounting, our, our, our uh, internal legal structures for the most part. Um, they see some, they have some need in their, see something in your work uh, in what your skills and what you can provide that, that may help address that need. So it's very different animal uh, in a, 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 of that, that sense. And we'll go through um, some of the answers question maybe a, a little uh, you know, better as we go. And then I think this is one of the really important ones to sort of address up front. Why do we engage in them? Um, you know, I'm sure if you talk to folks and maybe coming out of this, you'll be like, Oh man, that sounds like a lot of work. I could just put my time into getting another NIH grant, another VA grant, another NSF grant. Why why go through all this hassle? 
and really uh, it's a unique opportunity because you can translate things out into the world so much better through commercial entities in some ways. Um, especially for us uh, at Hurl, we do a lot of translational research here, you know, um, taking sort of ideas that are a little bit further along, really should be closer to products. Um, you know, the uh, Pitt, the VA, uh, who we also work for here, they don't market products, they don't uh, sell products. You know, so we're at a, a really a limitation as to actually getting them out there to people that could benefit from them and for the marketplace in general to benefit from them. And that's where for-profit companies or even nonprofit organizations um, can help disseminate that work and really help increase your impact. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you know, the academic world's starting to come around to, um, you know, other types of, of academic output and actually being able to translate devices, ideas, processes directly to uh, end users through commercial entities um, or nonprofits is a really important part of what we do. Obviously, um, you know, writing papers, presenting at conferences, these will remain very important measures of academic output, but I, I think we're we're headed in the right direction to acknowledge how powerful this can be. And I think that's one of the big reasons to engage here. And the couple examples I'll start out with, um, I think really highlight where we can, we're able to do something that we couldn't have done without partnering in this sort of way. And I think that's the best way to think about these sorts of um, partnerships and these things rather than, hey, this is just another source of money. Um, that's really not a great way to think about it. Um, you, you'll burn yourself out pretty quickly doing it that way. And in the end, it really should be benefiting overall society as well as your work too. And uh, sometimes when you just chase the dollars that that, that, that gets lost here. Um, you know, I, can't, I can't stress enough that mutually beneficial is uh, really the, 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 the name of the day here um, on it. So going to go through three examples of some industry sponsored and you'll see that they're kind of at, at different um, sort of ends of maybe where uh, these organizations can be. So uh, we worked with Amazon. Um, they had a, a need. Um, this was pre-pandemic and a few things got got shuffled uh, because of that although they're still still on track with this project but um they were running out of employees at their fulfillment warehouses. They were growing very rapidly. Um, you know, they've kind of tapped out in a lot of markets, a lot of their job pool uh, candidates um, where they're at, especially because they are literally everywhere in the United States and, and in many other countries. So, um, and I think pretty interesting of them, they were looking to essentially grow their pool of candidates by being able to include more people. Um, especially in a, a very kind of blue collar shift work, um, manual labor sort of environment. Um, they didn't have a lot of opportunities for people who use manual wheelchairs or for people that had lower extremity uh, disability. Um, we actually found out through a lot of this work that they had a kind of a huge already existing population. It uh, was maybe on limited work or on workman's comp that um, just had lower extremity injuries. Um, that there was going to be a big part of the value proposition on this, but they wanted to be able to, to look at their existing facilities and see how they could be adapted to um, for people with uh, wheelchairs to work in them. So I guess uh, we'll get to how you attract sort of these employers, but it was basically a reputational thing um, why they contacted us. Um, you know, we flew out to Seattle, we kind of fronted that, and um, I, I went through several of their facilities, looked at a lot of their processes, uh, spent a whole week out there kind of learning about them and what they do. They have a very peculiar culture. We'll sort of get back to that point here a little bit later um, that maybe is different from even a lot of other companies. I um, got to learn a lot about them and then really spent the next six weeks kind of trying to figure out, um, you know, some solutions we proposed based on what we saw coming up with a scope of work they could work with, negotiating budgets, and then figuring out how this would all, all, all could be done um, to sort of achieve their goals. So in the end, took, took some legal wrangling. Um, an interesting point of view here is uh, Pitt's used to being the big dog in, in a negotiation. They're used to having more lawyers, more money, 
bigger organization. Um, not the case when you're dealing with Amazon. They're a little bit more like dealing with the uh, government in some way just because of how large they are, how much money they have. Um, they're used to everybody sort of bending over backwards for them. So we had some interesting conversations about that. And that's one of the things when we get to talk about um, managing expectations, uh, that sort of goes along with that and prepping your sponsor that, hey, um, these things don't get done overnight uh, when we're working out sort of the legal and the contractual part of the agreement. It's better to disclose that up front and make sure that they have the appetite to to sit through six weeks or so of uh, of maybe a back and forth um, on a contract here, which uh, they don't like, but it's just just the way you got got to kind of keep them on the hook, but be upfront about that. Um, we ended up in the end creating a robotic seat, a little bit like power seat functions on a wheelchair, but uh, it had some uh, different specifications. Could do things like a little bit of strafing side to side. Um, we sort of mimic the turning portion with a uh, seat rotation, but what it allowed somebody to do is use one of their um, automatic packing machines. Um, it's those um, sort of white uh, bubble wrap envelopes. Those actually get created um, in an automatic fashion once you put a, a, an item into the machine, but they have to be picked off a, a belt, scanned, and then put it in, in, into the, the machine. And uh, we worked on the ergonomics for this, the chair helped compensate for some of the things that uh, a seated person couldn't do versus ambulatory. Um, we did a lot of work here at the lab, had Amazon folks out here on multiple occasions. Um, we did a test run out in Columbus, which uh, one of their large facilities that we could drive to. And then in the end, we tested about 15 people um, that we recruited, did an IRB protocol. Um, some of them were in, in a facility in Columbus and some of them were in a facility in Seattle. We took the device there, we use it in the field, we were able to support it in the field. Um, and uh, despite some bumps in the road, some setbacks, we, we got it done and um, Amazon decided to carry the project forward and they um, basically went to operationalize it. And the design we kind of co-created handed over, they handed over to a contract manufacturer to do another round of these. And they are working on, on rolling this out worldwide as well as a few process changes um, turned out that were good for people with disabilities, turned out being good for everybody. Um, so all their new facilities were getting a few of the, the uh, changes we recommended. And it also led to some additional consulting opportunities for us here. Uh, it was a great way to stay involved, great way to see some other things as well as help make sure our idea got to kind of carry forward. But a good example of something with a very, very large entity um here here with amazon um our next one here is our new chair here and a little bit different sponsor here that our sponsor was a non-profit um so uh the the back story here was that uh there's a gentleman down in texas his name is gordon hartman um was quite upset that his daughter with a disability was excluded from a lot of um things at amusement parks and water parks and uh, it's Texas. Put your money where your mouth is. Uh, he also happens to be a real estate billionaire and, and um, built a, a fully accessible wa uh, amusement park and then was adding on to that to build a fully accessible water park. Um, but he was using his nonprofit foundation um, as a vehicle for doing this to create sort of sustain ability with it. Um, they were upset that uh, for kids that use power wheelchairs, they were going to have to be pushed around in strollers um, in the park by their parents, which isn't a lot of fun when, when all the other kids are sort of moving around on their own because they didn't have a good solution to replace an electric powered wheelchair in a giant splash water park. Um, through friends of friends, and that's a, a really important thing, uh, you know, we kind of got in contact with them and they had heard about some pneumatic technology that we were working on. And um, so... We had some conversations with them. Dr. Cooper and I flew down to San Antonio, met them, learned a little bit more um, about what they were doing and figured that we could adapt our technology to make a, a power wheelchair that would be suitable for kids to ride around the park. Um, we knew we couldn't do the production on it. So we uh, 
kind of drug in some some additional friends uh, here. That's why we have uh, ADI Stealth and Pride. At the time, uh, ADI and w- was getting purchased by Stealth, and Stealth had recently been um, purchased by Pride. But we were mainly working through ADI, but um, some of the stuff was made at Stealth, uh, and then then definitely some help from uh, f- folks out in Eastern Pennsylvania here too. Um, but we work with them. Uh, we were responsible for creating a you know a design based on the technology we already had. Um, we uh, came up with the initial prototype, we came up with translatable drawings, and we did this in a really short time period. I think we did this in about a month and a half. Um, Normally a project like this would probably take nine months to a year. Um, We kind of threw everybody at it. And again, that's sort of a common theme when we talk about industry sponsor. When people are putting cash down, they usually want things quick. Um, and managing that expectation is, is is can be a tough thing while still maintaining your your health and uh, s- sanity w- w- while doing so, as well as that of your team um, on it. But we met some tight deadlines. Um, we got the prototype out. It was evaluated down at the park. We moved um, to more of a production process. I actually went down to San Antonio. Um, one of our, our our alumni, or now alumni, but was. Uh, one of our, our RST grad students was interning um, w- with Stealth on his internship and uh, came down to St- uh, San Antonio and helped us assemble. So it was good having some friendly faces, uh, some uh, pit folks on the ground at, uh, at places. And, and uh, again, friends, alumni are really important, help get things done. And uh, there's still 15 chairs at, at Morgan's Wonderland. Um you know, and that, that's really the big outcome here. The kids are getting to use this park every summer. They're getting to use these chairs. They're getting to have a great time. They're gaining independence while at the park. And so that really meets our mission while still being able to engage in this type of project. And it's something we would not have been able to do through kind of a traditional, um, you know, grant. And sort of going back to the Amazon, what what's the hook there? Amazon has the facilities, this process, they have hundreds of these facilities around the world. Um, you know, if we create one job for a person with a disability, each one of them, and that's not an unrealistic outcome of where they're headed with this, that, that's a huge impact that we wouldn't be able to make, make otherwise. So again, get back to that why is just really critical. Um, last one we'll kind of highlight here um, is uh, our... Um, Agile Life System uh, here, uh, again, sort of through friends of friends here, um, we met some gentlemen that had a very non-traditional startup. Um, you know, I think when we think of startup, we think West Coast, we think software, we think uh, young people staying up all, all night. Uh, these gentlemen are, are kind of on, on their second career and in a lot of ways just saw a need out there and think had a lot of empathy for um you know, folks that have uh, mobility issues as well as uh, issues with sort of transferring um, in and out of bed and caregivers that, that have to do this. But um, the company is called Next Health, and they had an existing product um, called their Agile Life System. And what it did was combine a manual wheelchair with a um, hospital bed that was able to basically transform almost like a transformer sort of, of uh, you know, uh, cartoon robot uh, to be able to transfer people from their bed to the wheelchair in a zero lift uh, sort of way for the caregiver. Um, looked a little crazy. We were a little skeptical when we first saw it, but uh, they they uh, took the chance, drove their device in a van down here from Connecticut, set it up in our shop, gave us a demo, and we're like, okay, that was cool. Um uh, after trying it, and uh, that's how things got started. Um, one of the needs that they were seeing was that there's a lot of limitations once you get into a depot-style manual chair that they're not the most mobile devices, and that a lot of their clients that were, especially these institutions, um, were asking for something that was more group two power wheelchair, that uh, sit-and-go type seating where people could be more active once they got out of bed, and, um, you know, we talked about applying for an, a traditional SBIR and, and we ended up doing one with them on their manual chair product that ended up being pretty successful to uh, adapt for a bariatric population. 
But for the power wheelchair, they wanted to move a little bit faster and they had some money that they uh, wanted to put into it. And we were able to, to do a contract with that. And we were able to um, basically adapt a power wheelchair, uh, create a new seating system for it, uh, create more control software to, to, to do the new things it was doing, as well as we did a remote monitoring software piece for them. Um, something that uh, we've done well in a couple of projects that they were were interested in seeing on theirs. I think in some ways is a little bit ahead or, or where healthcare is going, um, you know, being able to objectively show how much a product's um, being used. I think that's one of those great takeaways for us um, here is sort of that insight into the market and being able to engage in those, really understanding those parts of it that can help feed into some of our other research. Um, so we bench tested it, um, you know, here, um, we're on a couple rounds of prototypes here and we're able to, uh, sort of in partnership with them, apply for some additional, more traditional grant funding. And I think we have two or three grants now, um, sort of rolling out of that. Um, they've been able to seek some additional investment and they are, uh, working towards bringing this to market, looking for some strategic partnerships right now to be able to, to do the distribution. And that's in, in our space, uh, it is a tough thing, but uh, they're getting there and we're really excited about what this uh, is likely to do, especially for, for our older adult population that uh, is trying to stay at home or is looking for a little bit higher quality of life within an institution here. But, um, you know, again, a little bit different working with a, uh, a startup than, than the other two organizations here. So rolling out of some of these examples, you can kind of keep those in mind while we talk about sort of the, the next things. Um, how do you make this happen and what are some of the best practices or best things that we, we've learned here are going to sort of incorporate the next slide? And we're going to start out with building relationships because unlike uh, our government grants that are, are – um, supposed to be as objective as possible that uh, any qualifying person or institution should be able to apply to them without, um, you know, needing to know somebody without knowing the, the sort of secret handshake. Um, these aren't like that. Um, they really are based on relationship. And, and I'm going to start out with it, even though it's the last line, you know, building trust is, is key. They're, they're believing in you um, when they're doing this. Uh, but you're also believing in them. They're going to come through on their end and essentially not going to waste your time. All of you are talented. You could all be doing something that's going to be highly impactful. Um, you know, choosing to put your time and energy and talents into something uh, is just as much about, about um, you using that wisely as them getting something. Um, I think that's another thing to keep in mind. But, you know, how do you build those relationships? Uh, how do you find these sponsors? And really, you know, reputations, you know, where a lot of this comes from. And wh whether you're young in your career, uh, you, you've been around and already have have one. Um, you know, I think all of us here at Pitt here, Pitt has a great, great reputation. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, our region has a great reputation. Uh, you know, uh, whether you're from here or you've uh, assimilated here, it's a place known for hard work. It's a place known for innovation. It's a, a place known for, for getting things done. And, and we, we aren't what we are. We are not the West Coast. We are not New York City. We are Pittsburgh. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't advocate anybody shy away from that. I, if, if people don't like that, they're, they're the ones sort of missing out. I think we have, have a lot to offer sort of culturally here both at Pitt and sort of our, our broader broader region and, and, and our, our all of our folks that have sort of assimilated in with us that are from others here, uh, regions. So um, big part of it is your reputation. Um, it's also key to be active in sort of the published literature. A lot of times um, people are seeking some legitimacy for their product. You have to watch this on both ends. Um, you know, you want to do research on it, but you have to be, uh, objective, but a lot of times what companies are after is some sort of legitimacy for their product, that they're not just another sort of snake oil salesman making wild claims um, out there. That's a good thing that they're actually seeking that. Uh, you just got to be upfront with them that you're going to be objective on on any experiment or in, any data you're going to, to, to put out there. Um, you know, so being active in the published literature is uh, important. 
Another place that's really, I think, you know, again, academia is hopefully coming around a little bit to this is engaging the general public or the professional public um, that might not read uh, the the academic publications all the time or any time um, is another way to interact with people. We do a lot of tours here at Hurl. Um, sometimes it's like, uh, why are we doing all this? Uh, you know, we probably do close to 200 tours a year here in some fashion or another when we were in, in, the, in our ERC days 10 years ago, it was probably closer to 300. Um, that may be a little bit on the extreme end, but um, it's how you make friends. It's how you get the word out about the good work you do. And that's really one way to do it. Um, popular media is an, another uh, way to do that. I know sometimes that can be hard to do, but uh, Pitt does have some folks for, for sort of handling that. And if you have work that's really outstanding, uh, you shouldn't be shy about trying to get it out there through through popular um, media. It could be our news, but also like if for us in rehab here, it could be, you know, our sports and spokes. Some of our other lifestyle magazines are often looking for content, uh, should not be shy about getting that sort of thing out there. Um uh, you want a well thought out website. Um, it's your portal of the world. Um, it's really important that that relevant information, concise information, up to date information is out there. You'd be surprised at how many people find you simply by Googling your name. It's way more than you think. Um, and then another really important source are our alumni. And, and this, you know, applies to everybody. Everybody has outstanding alumni here in um SHRS. A lot of them are great advocates for the, the school here, and, and, and Pitt alumni are everywhere, um, especially in, in the rehab field. So, um, you know, it's always good to engage. It's always good to, to find find some of your, your friends that you didn't know were your friends from Pitt uh, out there, um, and can be a real way to sort of develop those um, relationships. So, um, you know, how did the project come about? If you find some folks that you might be interested in working with, how does the project come about? It really comes from a need. Um, a lot of times that's the company kind of coming up with the need, but it doesn't always have to be. Sometimes you can pitch ideas and try to license something to them and that can um, roll over into some industry sponsored work. That That's a little bit trickier, but uh, it happens from time to time and uh, would encourage anybody if they have any ideas that they've been working on that are potentially commercializable to Fill out the invention disclosure form on, uh, uh, I'm sure somebody, I probably should have put that in here somewhere. Um, you know, fill out that invention disclosure uh, fo uh, form. The folks at the Innovation Institute will help you sort through what comes next, um, especially if you've never done it before. Don't let that scare you away. There's, there's no such thing as a bad disclosure um, on it. Uh, folks at in Innovation Institute are really good at helping walk you through what, you uh, comes next and what what's appropriate, but creating some IP is a good way to get it sort of going the other direction. But a lot of times that company has a need and they see something in, in you, your work, your talents that can maybe help them solve that need. Um, and that's where a lot of this comes from. And, and it really starts out with conversations. Um, you know, Zoom's great here where we can kind of have these things a lot more fluidly than, um, you know, we used to, but if somebody invites you to their facility, do what it takes to get there. Um, you'll learn a ton about what they do, a lot about their culture, and then really understand the problems that they're uh, trying to address firsthand. The other thing that, uh, and this is where sort of the gambler's, uh, you know, mentality has got to come in. You know, sometimes you got to put a little bit of time in here to get one of these. You don't want to give away the farm right away, but uh Sometimes you got to float a concept out there to get people's imagination going. And I think that's one another take home point is that don't 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 assume that somebody's imagining what you're seeing in your head. Um, it may be really obvious to you. Um, that might not be the case to everybody else. Sometimes people need, uh, you know, a picture of the concept to kind of uh, get their imagination going. If it's more of a, a data collection driven study you may need to sort of outline how that data may benefit them. You're going to have to give them some of that for free. The delicate balancing act is always don't give too much away that they, you know, they're not going to hire you essentially. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not a charity here. Um, 
you know, uh, th they're in business. They're there to make money. Um, we, your time's valuable and you should be compensated for it. Um, but a lot of times it's, it's a lot of back and forth and you just kind of got to be ready for it. And sometimes it just doesn't work out at that point in time. Um, we've had some folks where we've come really close to doing something with, and for some other reason, they walk away from it, but everybody's polite and we come back a few later, years later and end up doing something with them. And again, it's sort of just being honest, open, and just it's not not a personal thing if it, if it doesn't work out. Um, they all have budgets, things change rapidly for companies too, and sometimes it just doesn't work out that time. But you, you might find that you have some mutual interest later on, and that's definitely happened to us. Um, the next thing, and this is probably the most important thing if you're going to actually go through with industry-sponsored work, is developing your scope of work. If you have a bad scope of work, you're going to have a bad time. Um, this is really where you kind of set up the ground rules for what they're going to pay you to do. Um, you can get really abused if, if you do this uh, uh, poorly. Um, unlike sort of your NIH um, you know, where you have this grant process, your things are pretty defined in what's in the grant. The outcomes are pretty well uh, defined when you write this thing. Um, you can submit almost nothing. If they sign it and it goes through PIT, you'll be fine. PIT will let you put a lot of garbage through um, if you're not careful. Um, but you really have to be sort of aware of what you're putting out there because in the end, you're kind of going to be held to it. Um, you know, so the big goal here is to define exactly what you're going to do and deliver in sort of layman's terms. And you want to be very explicit. Um, this will also go into basically the legal document that Pitt and whoever you're working with will sign. And in the end, if something really goes wrong, this is going to be the last ar ar arbitrator of that legal document. So it really is important. The other thing, and I've already stated this, it really should align with what you're doing. Don't just chase something because it you're chasing some money. It, it, this is tough and it'll just make it worse if you're not really interested and it should further your field and your career and what, what your, um, you know, your center or, or your lab sort of mission is. It should further that, that too. Um, we know you all can do great work, you know, but it, it's really where can you do the best work that's going to have the most impact um, on it here. So don't lose sight of that. Um, and sometimes in those deliverables, you can work some things that might be beneficial to the company. It may be directly beneficial to your, your work um, also in there. Don't don't hesitate to, uh, you know, kind of throw that in, in, in there if that's something you think they, they would kind of go for um, on it. Um, a couple of things having written up some good ones and some bad ones uh, in, in scope of work here. Um, you know, I guess my, my sort of uh, 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 list here would be, you know, be very explicit on what activities. It doesn't have to be ver verbose. I put plenty of outlines, bullet points in here uh, of the work, but the more explicit you are, the better. You always want to give yourself some wiggle room if you need the wiggle room, um, but you want to be very explicit here. Um if you're going to have, you're probably going to have some deliverables in it. Uh, companies really like seeing things. And sometimes like data is a little bit more of a ill-defined thing. You want to try to define that data as best as you could. I, it's a little bit of a, a, a thought experiment, but you can um, define it down into a report that's going to contain results of X, Y, and Z experiments, um, you know, be very explicit from that because what you're trying to set yourself up for is getting out of your industry sponsored project in the end. Um, and if you have this sort of poorly defined what the uh, what the goalposts are, you're going to find that those goalposts uh, run around quite a bit um, on you. So uh, it's really important. Um, and uh, if you're doing intermediate goals, and especially like companies like tying payment periods to intermediate goals. You want to make sure those are in there. I highly recommend trying to front load as much of the money you can. Um, companies big and small can be a little bit squirrely about paying at times, um, but that's just sort of the way things uh, go. Um, timelines. Timelines are really for the company in a lot of ways because they're usually they're doing this because they want things to happen fast. They can't do it in house as fast as you can. 
um, be very explicit about this. You're going to get a lot of pressure to get things done as fast as you can. Be honest with yourself. I'm terrible at this. Uh, Rory's always kind of smacking me on the head. You need to double that. And he's usually right. Um, when we're kind of putting these things together, everything takes, takes a little bit more time than you think it does. Um, so budget yourself in a little bit of padding, no matter how much they're, they're trying, trying to pressure you, um, sort of on things if you can, sometimes the opportunity is awesome and you just got to do it. But, um, you know, like the Morgan's Wonderland thing, they had a tight deadline. It was going to be cool. We knew we could do it. It was going to be a cool result. And it was, um, we did some crazy stuff, but it was fun. Um, you also want to define interactions. Uh, you'll get some people that want to talk to you every day on the phone. That's where that sort of conversation period, if somebody's calling you every day during that, you need to budget in some more time because they're going to be calling you constantly. If that's not your bag, picking up the phone at all hours of the day for that, um, you want to kind of build that into your scope of work about when you're going to communicate and set some boundaries around there. If you're not into that, just I'm going to pick up the phone anytime they call it. And, and I do recommend that. Um, you also want to make sure you're including any travel. It's always better to get the travel money on your side of the budget, not have them do it. Um, it cuts down on your conflicts quite a bit, as well as you kind of control what tickets you're getting. Those sorts of things make your life a little bit easier, especially if you're uh, taking some long overnight flights, those sorts of things um, on it. And then uh, any reports you're delivering, which I think reports are great because companies love them. It's a great way to kind of plant your flag that something's done. A um, little bit of work for you, but um, great way to define an endpoint or a goal um, on it. Um, the other thing is make sure in that agreement you include all the materials you need from the sponsor. You know, if they're providing product that you're going to test, you're basically, you want in your timeline that your shot clock doesn't start until they provide that product. Um, you know, if somebody's giving you a wheelchair or a prosthetic and then you have to do the testing, you have to modify with it. You know, if they're weeks or months late on delivering that, it's going to adversely affect your timeline. That's not good overall, but at least if they're delinquent and breaking the agreement, it's harder for them to come back and kind of blame you later, um, you know, sort of for that. And it's also good to just get it on their radar that, hey, we're signing something. We know we need to provide this. It's less casual. It's more, okay, we have to do this. And uh, don't be shy about asking for stuff from, from, from companies if you're going to need to complete that work. Uh, I really ha almost had nobody tell me we couldn't do something in terms of a company providing equipment that they produce or or in-house resources. They're usually really generous when it comes to that sort of uh, in-kind sort of uh, part of it. And they can really be make or break for your project. Um, that probably should be should be highlighted because that's often overlooked here. Um, you know. You really want a definitive manner for ending the project and you want that in sort of the legal agreement. I usually like it a, a sort of final report. I like calling it the final report. I like referring to it as the final report. Um, I like including, you know, the generalities of what's going to be in there. And so when we're at the end and the sponsor's like, oh, that was great, but can we do this, this, and this? You can politely say, and this will kind of get to our next slide, yeah, we're happy to do that, but we need to revisit our scope of work and our budget to be able to accommodate that in our timeline. Um, it's just a polite way of doing it if it's already in writing and already part of the expectation. So um, can't stress the need uh, for having a good exit strategy. You won't be looking like a bad guy or bad person. It's just the business part of it, and you need to take care of that sort of upfront. Another one that can kind of create some anxiety is negotiating a budget. Um, there's always a little bit of poker face to this, but uh, I find that's not the best thing either. Um, so sometimes the worst thing is them telling how much you, you how much money they're willing to spend on something, um, even though that sounds like a good idea. I try to focus on more about what you need to do that scope of work. Get the scope of work nailed down first, then go talk about come up with what your budget it is. Focus on what you need. You're not doing it. They're, they're a for-profit company in a lot of cases here. If you're, they're like Amazon. They're making lots of money. You don't need to be doing that, that them any, any, anything for free. Make sure you're covering everything, especially all the little things. They really do add up. Um, 
you know, on these sorts of things, you know, you're likely involved with some things that are, are, are a little bit different than your normal grants. You're likely to be getting expedited shipping on a lot of things. You might be shipping devices across the country. You might be doing travel. You might need to even do some overtime um, for your folks. You might need to bring in some other folks that, you know, you might not necessarily work with. Um, all these things take money and, and don't, you know, um, kind, kind of leave them off the list when you're doing their budget. Um, you know, be honest with yourself. Sometimes when you get excited about doing something, it's easy to kind of, oh, I can do this cheaper because I'm, I'm more likely to get it if I do that. I, again, sort of a bad, bad hole to go down. Um, so be honest with yourself. That can be a really tough thing sometimes when you're, you're excited, you're ambitious and you, you uh, you want to get something done. Um, sometimes you got to back off and really take a look at what's, what's going to need to happen. Um, the other thing is speed costs money. I don't think I've ever been involved with one of these things that hasn't been like, I wanted this done yesterday. Um, speed can be done, but it costs more money than, you know, if you drag out a project longer. Um, the Morgan's Wonderland thing, we did most of our work in two months on that project. Um, but we basically threw everybody we had on it. And um, that probably cost us additional money just to be able to do that because there was lost efficiency on other product uh, projects, those types of things, prioritizing things, speeding things up always costs, ha has a premium. You need to factor that in. Your time is valuable. You could do something else also that's worthwhile um, here. Don't, don't forget that. And, um, you know, the budget's not the time to forget about that. Uh, in here, I think a lot of us, are, you know, sell ourselves a little bit short about what the, the things we do are worth because uh, we don't necessarily sell them on a day to day basis like you are at a for profit company, um, but they are valuable and don't forget, forget that. Um, and if they don't agree to your budget, if they're like, whoa, 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 that's more than we want to spend. Um, don't don't sell yourself out. Um, go back to that scope and you know, always have a little bit of a plan B where you can. Uh, reduce things to get it maybe where, where they need. Um, we've done some things, especially recently here, where we've uh, done things in phases and they've uh, the sponsor's been like, well, we got this much. We really like, oh, well, how about we do phase one and two and uh, we'll leave phase three up for a later date and time if uh, you do that. So there's always kind of ways to, to kind of work that, but I, I don't ever recommend sort of uh, selling yourself out, out on that one here. Um, the other really important one here is managing uh, customer expectations. You know, NIH has, uh, you know, I'm sure it's quarterly reports is how you uh, talk with your um, program officer. There's very well-defined times when you talk with your sponsor when it's a government um, sort of related uh, grant. It's different for um, industry-sponsored work um, here. It's often up to you and up to them. Again, it's always good if it's in the... Uh, sort of scope of work here, um, but I find that the more you're in contact with them, when the inevitable things that go wrong, go wrong, you're going to get a lot lot more empathy um, if they've kind of been in on it, even if it's uh, kind of a short check-in on the phone, with, you know, just you and one other person that's sponsoring it. Um, you want to explain what's happening. Don't just tell them the good, tell them the bad. Um, you know, sometimes uh, when things magically get done quick, um, and you don't tell them how hard it is, uh, that, that can also be a bad thing, even if it seems like a really successful outcome. Um, you know, this is hard. It's going to be hard. Don't make it look easy um, all the time uh, on, on things. The other thing is surprises are bad for, for the sponsor. They shouldn't hear anything about something in a final report for the first time. Um, you know, good, bad, or indifferent surprises are bad. Um, so always kind of keep them in the loop about what's going on and also gives them an opportunity if there is something that's going wrong not meeting their expectations you may have the ability to sort of change course before the project comes to a head in the end where they don't want to pay the final bill and um, are, are demanding tons and tons of extra work because they didn't like what you did um, I, I think that's probably the best thing for managing expectations here have your, your plan for conversation we alluded to this earlier phone, meetings, reports. If you're not into doing this at all hours of the day, define this really well up front. 
Um, if not, you're probably going to be on the phone all hours of the day. Um, but it's best when you have a good plan uh, for these things, especially uh, if people are flying in to, to, to check on something. Um, that, that's another really important to know about those ahead of time so you're working towards those goals. The other thing that may be a little bit overlooked here um, is you need to educate industry folks on sort of academic culture in your organization. Um, we are different from a, a, a sort of fee for service business. You know, we're not Kinko's. We don't, you don't send us a file and we print something. Um, you know, we are doing a value add. What we're doing is not a commodity. Um, if it were, we wouldn't be doing it. Um, you know, Pitt's also a large institution. They're conservative. A lot of times that's why we've been here for 200 and some years. Um, but it also sort of limits our, our ability to change quickly on, on certain things. You need to educate them on that. It's just sort of the, the price of doing business with really any large academic institution. We don't control the processes at Pitt, especially when it comes to some of our contracting. I know they're busy folks. I know sometimes, uh, you know, especially when uh, NIH grants go in, they get really busy in their offices. You got to kind of try to convey this up front to your sponsor that, hey, we're a large institution. We, we stick to our commitments, but it takes us a little bit to get into them. Um, and then the really important thing is that not all research turns out how you like it. You know, First and foremost, we're scientists, we're going to be objective. If you're looking for a certain outcome and the data just doesn't support it, um, you got to be ready to be disappointed. Um, hopefully, they're reasonable people and they realize that there's value to the scientific process. If they're not, um, you know, they're probably not good people to be working with again, and you're better off sticking to uh, your integrity and keeping uh, with it. But uh, you just need to kind of get them from the outset that they're not paying for something, they're paying for research and research doesn't always turn out well um, on it. Um, so that's uh, something that's often a surprise to uh, industry partners. The other sort of soft thing that like seems to work out really well is introduce them to your people, um, your team that's working on it. We got some great students, we got some great staff, we got great faculty members that we all associate with. They love it. They love talking to people. They love learning from them. It also kind of puts a little bit of a human face on it when you're getting the heat to get something done that, hey, you can say, hey, Joe's working on this. And, uh, you know, they get, okay, that's a real person doing this. Um, you know, it, it just goes a long way. I can't 100% explain it, but, uh, you know, and it's great for your undergrad students, your graduate students. They get to meet some people um you know you know this way uh it's exciting for them um you know we've taken some of our undergrads out to you know headquarters at amazon we've had them out in facilities um we've had some of our, our graduate students down in san antonio at the parks working with some of these companies uh, great experience for them and uh you know they get to meet professionals in their environment and it's a, just a great opportunity to kind of meet some of that why are we doing this um what, what helps us with our mission uh, another thing is, uh, if setbacks happen, have a new plan, communicate it quickly. E even the, the the toughest sticklers on, on contracts, and we, I've worked with a few of them, if they understand things come up, if you've been doing some of these other things, that, that you're not just making stuff up, um, but always have a plan, but also don't hide it from them. Um, tell them what's happening, be frank take your lumps, move on, get, get back to get back on track. Um, and really uh, all is well that's end well, ends well. Um, you know, it's a really uh, one of my favorite phrases. And while maybe not completely true, um, you know, a lot's forgiven if the project comes to a, a successful con conclusion, uh, even if it's a little bit rocky along the way. Um, so uh, a few of the things that are kind of unique um, and R&D when it comes to these sponsor product projects that you might not find with your regular grants here. Uh, speed, speed, speed. Um, everybody wants something quickly. It's not like our, you know, our, our, our grants to VA or NIH where we, yeah, we'll hear back in six months how that turned out. Um, things turn around. And I think one of the things that they have in their back of the, their minds a little bit of prejudice against academia is that it can't move fast. It can, maybe not as fast as they would like, but probably faster than they expected. But 
um, you kind of got to be ready to meet that. And uh, even if they're not throwing that at you initially, it pretty much comes up in all these projects um, on them. And also just being timely uh, about communication. The challenge is also sort of keeping things from being open-ended. Your NIH grants have a clear endpoint on them. They're going to stop paying you at some point. You're going to have to turn in a final report, good, bad, or indifferent, um, and it's over. Sponsors, especially folks that are giving you uh, less money, tend to try to get maximize that value. Um, always asking for a little bit more. Um, again, that's something that's really different and something that uh, – is always good to start out with sort of managing those expectations of the deliverables. Um, you enforce more of the rules here. Um, the government has a lot of rules to protect both them and their grantees. Pitt does have some rules. There'll be some things in your contract, but a lot of things with communication, how your workflow, how you're handling things. Um, you kind of got to set that in the scope and you kind of got to um, enforce that yourself. And that is one of the more challenging uh, things when in, in, in engaging in this. And lastly, you always have to be objective. I, I shouldn't have to say this, but, um, you know, when you have somebody that really has a result in their, their mind, um, sometimes industry folks have that a little bit more kind of concrete than we do here in academia, where we, we know it's an experiment. Um, you just kind of got to stick to uh, your field, your professional sort of um, you know, beliefs and, and uh, practices, and uh, th there'll just be some disagreements sometimes. Um, it, it'll come out better for you in the long run, even if it may seem seem a little harsh in the short term uh, on that. And I only bring it up. I know uh, everybody's above board, but there can be a little bit more pressure in that regard in these types of things. And then lastly, I'll kind of close, you know, ending these things is a re really uh, – important part. Uh, some of these are obvious, but, uh, you know, if anybody's new to this, uh, I can't stress these enough, you know, meet your deliverables. Uh, people are pretty serious um, about that. If you can finish on time, not always possible. Um, like I say, setbacks do happen, but uh, it's always a little bit um, easier if you kind of hit the key, key timeline and key, key deliverables. Um, on time. And then your sponsor may ask for more work. You just got to be really politely suggest that we revisit the scope of work. What's in there is in there. What's not in there is something that's, that's open to, uh, you know, additional discussion and creating an additional scope of work around. And that's how you kind of want to frame it. And that gets them on that idea of, okay, additional scope of work means additional budget while still being polite about it here. A um, little personal thing, at least from experience here, it's always dangerous to add on more work while work's ongoing. I like to try to, you might have it simmering in the background, but don't sign those agreements until you find out that you've successfully concluded the current work you're on, especially if they owe you a lot of money at that point, <laughs> um, which is sometimes the case with the way, way the contracts get set up through PIT. So um, I always try to put those off to as much of the work's done and as much of the payments are already kind of done in terms of adding additional scope of work. It's a good thing that they want to do work, but you got to make sure that that's not just a way of sort of dragging out the pro project uh, in some way that you're not going to get compensated for. Um, I always like take, discussing the final deliverables in advance. Scope works a great place to do that, but in the intermediate, as you're getting close to those deadlines, as the work's progressing, keep referring to the final report. Um, so they kind of get it in the end that final means sort of final. Um, it's a lot of slow suggestions sometimes and reinforcing that over a couple meetings can, can really help be like, okay, if we, we still want their help, we got to pay for it after this uh, or additional. Um, and then follow up after the work's complete. There's a couple folks I've worked with that don't work at the companies they're at. I still talk to on a regular basis. They're still in the industry, related industries. They're good folks. Um, some of them have come back with us with additional work. It's always good to hear about how some of these projects uh, advance. And even if things, you know, are a little rocky at times, a lot of times time heals a little bit of wounds and, uh, a lot of times people don't appreciate how much work was done or how impactful it is to their organization until a little bit of time's passed. And I think that's also another thing that in academic culture, 
we tend to look at the long game a, a lot. And, um, you know, what we're seeing while we're in it is really valuable. And sometimes other folks don't see that until it's done and sort of those uh, intangible benefits start pouring on them, um, you know, from their organization or their customers or whatnot. And all of a sudden, what you know, you go from being the worst person in the world to the best person in the world after six months or a year. Um, so uh, never hesitate to follow up. I've never gotten a bad reception from anybody just just doing a little follow up email after a while. So um, that's all I have for today. Happy to uh, address any questions. I appreciate everybody that kind of hung in there uh, for the hour with me. Thanks, Garrett. That's a lot of great information. We have just a couple minutes. Um, could be a question or two. Um, okay, so the the impasse, and this definitely does happen. Um, I think it's the best way is to if they haven't been specific, and usually they are very specific on on, on the red lines to begin with. Um, you know, Pitt has some hard red lines um, on things. Companies will have some hard red lines on things. I think it's finding out that that um, red line that you're coming to is just something that is, hey, this is not standard language for us, so I'm going to red line it, or if that's sort of a hard red line. Um, I don't want to speak for anybody at Pitt Legal, but I know, like, you know, we reserve the right to publish things. Um, uh, you know, that's just part of what we do here. That, that tends to be a, a, a hard red line. Uh, kind of thing for Pitt. So sometimes it's just finding out what those are. The other thing can sometimes be, uh, you know, sometimes we start out with a company's document. Sometimes we start out with Pitt's. Sometimes if you're not getting through one way, sometimes you got to flip it around and, and go the other way. But it, it definitely um, can happen. And I think the other thing is the, the lawyers at Pitt never like this, but um, sometimes it comes down to how much risk Pitt's willing to absorb. And sometimes talking through for that specific project, what the actual risk is for agreeing to a condition or striking a condition can help you decide how hard of a red line that is. So that would be my experience, but uh, each one of these is kind of different. <laughs> There's there's a couple other questions okay. here. They're kind of kind of big questions. I'm not sure we're going to have time to uh, address these, but um, there may be topics for future uh, seminars and how to share IP and uh, deal with IP. But the other question, Garrett, there was about yeah. what what are your biggest holdups in regard to speed. Um, you know, it comes at different times in the project. Uh, always initially, it's getting that contract done. Um, you know, it, you, I'm not saying that uh, anybody's not doing their job. It just takes time to review those. And you're not able to provide them with much progress updates during that. Um, it, and it's not a bad thing that things wait a little bit in, in a lot of regards just to make sure everybody knows what they're getting into. Um you know, that, that can be a hang up. The, the other thing that, that, that can kind of uh, be a hang up is making sure you're getting the right resources when things start. Cause oftentimes they start at a random start date. So if you have students, graduate students coming in for the term, or uh, we, we utilize a lot of co-op students. Um, you know, if you're kind of in the middle of a semester um, th that can hurt you sometimes with, with personnel um, but you always kind of got to look to where you can buy some time. Like uh, people may disagree with me on this, but get stuff shipped to you as fast as you can um, if, if you're under under a pinch. Um, you know, you you can trade time for for money in some cases, and if you know you're going to get the screws put to you with speed, that's that's a big big part of it. Um, you know, getting your supply chain and then getting your your, your people in in place to do do something. Um, and then I also think just kind of conveying to your team or anybody you're partnering with at Pitt that you're on a time sensitive thing. You're going to try to give them as much time as possible, but to try to head that off beforehand that you're, you're going to hand them a hot potato at some point in the project and, uh, hopefully they, uh, understand, um, IP issues. A lot of times we negotiate that in the scope of work. Uh, I know George has helped us with that with Amazon. Um, you know, if you're there 
if you're creating IP, co-creating IP with them, um, and they want exclusive rights, they have to work that out with, uh, you know, you know, Pitt. And a lot of times that's best to do that ahead of time. It's also a little bit different game when they're already putting money into it. Um, so, uh, you know, that that's where we get, get, get our, uh, you know, our, our Innovation Institute folks uh, involved. And they generally can uh, get, guide you through things here here on that. But there, there, there's different ways to skin that cat and um, that they, they can help you uh, figure out what what's best for the for the project. And sometimes you got to remember the impact's worth it. <laughs> um, you know that uh, especially if we're working with some, some of the nonprofit organizations. You know, maybe it has some commercial value being out there, but you know, if we're going to make thousands of dollars, but we're going to get you know, we were in the New York Times with the uh, water park stuff. We were on CNN. You know, we made lots more money in, in uh, earned advertising essentially that way for the university than uh, we would have off any license, even though we did do a license with that. Um, but that kind of can come into play with that a little bit and trying to determine the value. All right, Garrett, I'm afraid we're out of time. Um, I'm sure there's probably more questions, but maybe people can contact you uh, independently if they, they have a burning question for you, if that's okay. Yeah, no problem. Great. I just want to thank everyone for being here. If uh, if you're new to the, the seminar, I just want to let you know we do this um, the second Monday of every month, um, varying topics um, associated with you know translation of technology. Um, if you have any ideas for seminars you'd like, um, we, we'd be glad to hear them, see what people are interested in. Just drop me an email or Paul or Karen. Um, next month, uh, we have uh, Dan Broderick. Uh, speaking, Dan. Dan's here. Dan, do you want to give us a sneak peek on what you you want to you're going to cover next, or did you drop off? You might have stepped away. Yeah. So yeah, Dan. Dan, who is an EIR with the Innovation Institute, he'll the, the topic or the title for our next next week next month's uh, workshop is sources of funding. What you need to know. Uh, Dan will share his. Uh, 30 years of investing in fundraising experience to review the various sources of early stage capital that are available to uh, our researchers here at Pitt to help further progress their, uh, their work.